Hey everyone, and welcome back for the riveting finale of Battling Biology. In the last mini lecture, mini lecture number three, I talked to you about a technique that you can use to help you remember all of this stuff in chapter two and eventually in chapter five. That secret trick, of course, is drawing pictures. If you haven't watched mini lecture three already, go ahead, pause this one, go back, watch mini lecture three, and then watch this one. I explain a little bit more about my thought process in terms of drawing. Now, by now, hopefully you've been convinced that drawing is a really helpful way to learn this stuff. And if you haven't been convinced yet, trust me, practice a little bit. You're gonna have a harder, you're gonna have an easier time with this stuff if you draw the pictures rather than trying to think about it like a list of memorizable terms. So well, the next thing I want to teach you guys about learning to draw is a map of the brain. Brain parts are probably one of the biggest things that students ask me about. How do you remember what they are? How do you remember where they are? How do you remember what it is they do? And I always tell them the same thing, drawing pictures. So when I want to draw a picture of the brain, I usually start with something that isn't the brain, but rather the thing the brain sits right on top of. Something that's in some ways an extension of the brain, and this is of course the spinal cord. Your spinal cord is that super fast two-way highway that carries information from your brain out to your body and information from your body out to your brain. Motor information comes out and sensory information comes in. Now remember in drawing your picture, go ahead and draw along with me, but in drawing your picture, remember, the key is not the quality of your picture, but rather making something that's understandable to you, that as you draw it, you can tell yourself the story. How does the brain work? How is the brain built? How do these parts fit together? That's the point, because you know my pictures sure as hell are not pretty. So next, what I like to think of is the part of your brain that's built right up on top of, on top of the spinal cord. That's the lowest part of your brain, lowest both in terms of its location and in terms of its complexity. Some places in your book may refer to this as the hindbrain. Other places may refer to it as the brain stem. It's the same thing. One of the most important parts of the brain stem for you to know about, and of course for you to use, is your medulla. The medulla oblongata, and I'm gonna, um, I'm going to abbreviate a lot of these terms because I just don't have space or really time to write out the names. The medulla or medulla oblongata takes care of a lot of the most vital functions that your brain does. Things like pumping your blood, automatic breathing, digestion, blood pressure, really basic things like that. The sort of thing that if you didn't have a medulla, you'd need machines to help you function. This also kind of creates the structure of the brainstem because you'll see everything else is built around it. In fact, the next part we'll talk about is located right inside the medulla. This part is called the reticular formation. The reticular formation is turned off by melatonin, or at least shut down by melatonin. And melatonin makes you feel sleepy. So then you'd figure the reticular formation is involved in alertness and awakeness. And with that, you would be right. That's exactly what the reticular formation does. The next part we can talk about is called the pons. The pons doesn't sit on top of, but is rather wrapped around the medulla. And the pons does nothing. I don't mean it does nothing, but it just doesn't do any thinking. The pons is a band of fibers or of axons that allows the two halves of the cerebellum to talk to each other and for signals to go from the cerebellum up to the brain and down to the body and for information from the body and the brain to get to the cerebellum. It's just another really big highway. So of course, as involved as this thing is in the cerebellum, it wouldn't surprise you to know that the cerebellum is located right here, right next to the pons. Now this is one of the first places that I can start to show you the orientation of the brain here, that this is the back of your brain and this would be the front of your brain because your cerebellum is located right here in the back of your brain. The cerebellum is involved in what we call fine motor coordination. Anything that involves practice, anything that's complex that you do with your body, things like writing, like talking, playing basketball, walking, balancing, all of these things are jobs for your cerebellum. If you really want to emphasize what the cerebellum does, you can try living without one. In fact, there's a really great, well, I wouldn't say great way, but there is an interesting way that you could try lesioning your cerebellum temporarily, trying to function without it at home. Now, of course, you should only do this if you're legally allowed to do so. In fact, you can imagine the way to do this is to think about, well, what would it be like if you couldn't talk very well, if you couldn't balance very well, if you couldn't focus very well, if you couldn't walk very well? Have you ever known somebody who acted like this, at least for a little while? Yeah, maybe somebody who's had, what, three or four drinks and isn't a heavy drinker, right? Turns out one of the main places that alcohol affects your brain is in your cerebellum. It affects the decision-making parts of your brain first, but then it really knocks out your cerebellum. And you can think about how easy it is to function without one. You slur your speech, you can't balance, you can't focus, you have a really hard time, and it's because your cerebellum just isn't working. Now, another part of the high, or of the hind brain of the brain stem I want you to know about sits right here on top of the medulla, on top of the pons, and this is called the midbrain. 
Now, it is a little confusing for the midbrain to be a part of the brain stem or the hindbrain, but it's just the name of this part. The midbrain is involved in sensory motor coordination. It's involved in orienting to stimuli. I like to remember that it, that it receives input from the eyes and from the ears and provides output to the neck and shoulders. Now, you say, what the heck does that mean? Well, I'll tell you what it means. What it means is that your midbrain allows you to orient to surprising stimuli like this. Yeah, exactly like that. So as long as you're still with me, and hopefully you are, you know what happens when something surprises you that you don't expect, especially if it comes from an unexpected place like the corner of your vision. If something surprises you, you're going to jump, but you're also going to look right at it. It's because vision is so important to us. What your midbrain does, it pays attention to things that are happening around you. And if you see or hear something surprising, you look immediately at it. Put both your eyes right on it so you can see if it's a threat. This is what I want you to know about your brain stem. The next main part of your brain that I want you to know about, the main segment of the brain I want you to know about, is something called the subcortex. It's named that because it lies right under the cortex, that big fancy outside part of your brain. And this starts with a part of your brain that sits right on top of your midbrain. It is called the thalamus. The thalamus is a relay station for information in your brain. It takes information from your eyes and routes to other areas of the brain, from your ears to other areas of the brain. It really is information from your senses all over your brain. Now, I'm putting this here because remember, your brain has two of everything, one on each side, and that goes for everything in the subcortex and the, sub and the cortex also. Now, wrapped around the thalamus is another part of your subcortex, something called the basal ganglia. Now, this is a really ugly basal ganglia, Remember, you've got two of these guys. Your basal ganglia are involved in motivation and movement. They provide rewards when you do something great, and they help you get to places. Um, you might not be surprised to know that the basal ganglia make use of a lot of dopamine. Now, I want you to know what dopamine is. It makes sense that dopamine would be used in the basal ganglia because it's involved in reward and movement. Think about it this way. The basal ganglia is good for making sure that you get to the places you need to get to, and then you're happy that you got there in the first place. There are a couple of other parts of the subcortex I want you to know about. One is this thing that follows the shape of the basal ganglia a little bit. As we go along here, you can see this thing I'm kind of filling in right here. This is called the hippocampus. The hippocampus, now see that works okay. The hippocampus, except I run out of space, the hippocampus is involved in processing memory. If you lose the hippocampus, you can't save new memories. This is what happened with uh, people who suffer from anterograde amnesia, what you read about in chapter 8. If you can't make new memories, it's because your hippocampus can't process new ones. The next part I want you to know about is this thing perched here right on the end of the basal ganglia in the hippocampus, this ball, this, uh, ball or almond-shaped thing right here. We call this the amygdala. The amygdala, in a lot of ways, is the fight or flight area of your brain. It is involved in both the aggressive anger response as well as the fear response in your brain. Now, it activates these responses in your body, but it's also responsible for saving this information when it comes to your memories, which makes sense. What are the most important memories? The ones in which you almost die. Those are places you want to stay away from, people you want to stay away from, things you want to stay away from, and you don't want to forget them. Now, of course, don't forget about things like the suprachiasmatic nuclei. These are responsible for releasing hormones in your um, internal clock. And then there is also the cingulate cortex. The cingulate cortex extends around the basal ganglia in the same spiral shape. And it's involved in alertness and awakeness also, paying attention to things. This pretty much rounds out what I want you to know about the subcortex. And from here... We can move on to the biggest, most recent, most advanced part of your brain, the cortex. And one of the cool things about the subcortex and the cortex is you notice that they both follow this spiral shape when it comes to the shape of your brain. And you see this when we look at the cortex too, this kind of spirally basal ganglia shape. In fact, now my cortex is going to be really ugly, but you'll see what I mean. Your cortex creates the same kind of spiral shape. Now this is a really really ugly cortex, but the point is not for you to have a pretty cortex, it's for you to be able to remember what the cortex looks like generally, help you remember where parts are and what it is they do. Remember your cortex, this really advanced part of your brain is split into four main parts. These four main parts have four main jobs, and we'll start up here with your frontal lobe. The frontal lobe is what I like to think of as the do-stuff lobe. 
I call it the do stuff flow because it's involved in moving, it's involved in making plans, it's involved in controlling yourself, it's involved in personality, it's involved in understanding things and using language. If we're doing complex human things, we're using our frontal lobes. The next lobe we can talk about here is the temporal lobe. Now this isn't where the name comes from, but I find it easy to remember this is the temporal lobe because it's next to your temples. You also notice it's next to your ears, so you might imagine that it is involved in the processing of hearing, and you'd be right. Located right inside the temporal lobe is the hippocampus. So what's it also involved in? Processing of memory. So we got hearing, we got memory right here. If we go on the back of your brain, we can see the occipital lobe. The occipital lobe has one job. Unlike just about any other lobe in your brain, the occipital lobe only has one job. If you figure it out, occipital sounds kind of like optic also. If you draw a picture of an eyeball right up here, you get a line going straight back to the occipital lobe is involved in processing vision. If you want to know how important vision is for our survival, we've got 25% of our brain dedicated to it. Now my favorite lobe to talk about is this one right up here. And it's called the parietal lobe. The parietal lobe does lots of different things. Just making a note about vision here. The parietal lobe does lots of different things. It's involved in processing touch, somatic sensation. It's involved in processing proprioception, where your body is in space your vestibular sense, where you're balanced. It's involved in processing where your body ends and where the world begins, where things in the world are located, and your memory, your knowledge of how to get to places. In this way, even though the parietal lobe does lots of different jobs, it's really involved in just one thing. And that one thing is maps. Now you see how there I used a picture, a really, really ugly picture, to help me remember where absolutely everything in the brain is. Well, not absolutely everything, but a heck of a lot of the things in the brain are. You can make this picture as complex or as simple as you like, but using this tool over and over, practicing this picture at least once every single day is a way to make sure that you really get to ace this exam. Now I promise I really wanted to show you guys this stuff, but this is going to be the last of the really long mini lectures. The next of them are going to be short, and especially with the stuff like this where I'm sure some of these things are difficult, go ahead, go into the forums on Canvas and request a mini lecture topic on something that you think you'd like to know more about, something that you think is interesting. Even if it's not something specifically related to this course, if there's some psychology thing that you'd like to know more about, go ahead and request a mini lecture topic and I'll be happy to shoot one for you. Um, if you do have questions on things, if you're having a hard time on something, especially coming up to exams, remember I've got office hours. Times where you can call me in my office right here at beautiful Santa Fe. Uh, where you can send me emails, where you can Skype with me at SF Psychology, or you can always come in person too. If none of my office hours times works for you, just let me know. We'll set up another time to talk on the phone, to Skype, or to meet in person. Good luck, have fun with psychology, and I'll see you on Canvas.